Okay, welcome everybody. Uh, we are going to talk about the basics of deep learning. So my name is Heli Helskyho. Everybody knows me as Heli from Finland because my last name is quite impossible to pronounce for anybody, but Heli is quite simple. I have graduated from University of Helsinki with a master's degree in computer science and currently work on, working on my doctoral studies. Uh, it, they are involved with machine learning and that's probably one of the reasons I love to talk about machine learning. I've been working with Oracle products since 93 and on IT since uh, 90. So anything to do with data and databases is very close to my heart. And that's why I find machine learning also quite interesting. I'm a CEO for Miracle Finland, Oracle Ace Director, Oracle Crownbreaker Ambassador. And I have been listed as one of the top influencers in IT sector in Finland for five years in a row. I'm a speaker. <laughs> I speak a lot for a Finn that's unusual. We are known to be very quiet people, but I do speak. And I also write books. So I have written two books, one by myself and another one with other people. And being honest, this is still a secret. I'm working on a new book now with some fantastic people. So these are the two, two books that I have out at the moment. The, one, the first one about database designing and the second one about SQL and PL SQL. As I mentioned, I'm a member of the ACE program. If you're interested about that, please go and ask for more information, either from me or anybody from the ACE program itself. And now to the topic itself. So what is machine learning? It's an important part of the artificial intelligence. So it is kind of the heart or the brain of artificial intelligence. It's the field of study that gives computers the ability to learn without being explicitly programmed, said Mr. Arthur Samuel in 1959. So it is a systematic study of algorithms and systems that improve their knowledge or performance with experience. There are plenty of use cases for machine learning in real life, but just some examples that you will know what we are talking about. Spam filters, lock filters or alarms, data analytics, image recognition, speech recognition, medical diagnosis. This one is my favorite, by the way, because there's so many things the computer can do that we cannot do. So medical diagnosis is what I'm betting for here in, in, in the machine learning field. Robotics is also very interesting. I love to have somebody vacuuming in my house so I don't have to do it myself or moving the lawn or something like that. So, so the jobs that I prefer somebody else to do, why not to have a robot to do it? Fraud protection or detection like credit cards. If your credit card has been stolen, it will be realized quite quickly because of machine learning. Product, music, movie recommendations, quite interesting areas as well. Um, self-driving cars and so on. So a lot of things that are machine learning use cases. But today we talk about deep learning. So in machine learning, the uh, thing we need to do is find the features that are important for our, our machine learning task. But deep learning makes that more simple. It does the feature extraction for us. So instead of doing a lot of work, we let the computer do that work. That is not the silver bullet. Of course, it will take more resources and so on and more time and blah, blah, whatever for the computer to do. So it's not that whenever you have a machine learning problem, let's use deep learning. No, only in some cases, it's the best solution. So in this example, we have an input, which is the car. And machine learning comes out with a conclusion if this is a car or if it's not a car. For us, it's very simple because we know so much without realizing we know so much. So when I see a picture of a car, I immediately know it's a car. It doesn't matter if it's Volkswagen or if it's uh, Porsche or whatever. I know it's a car, but the machine does not. It does not have the knowledge we have already in our heads since we've been very small. And every year, every day, we learn more. So what are the use cases for deep learning? Well, text or voice, like natural language processing. So it can be processing natural language or automatically recognize what I'm saying. And what I'm saying here can be translated to text and then used with another machine learning process as an input. Or the text can be translated as speech. So if, if I can't see, I can hear. So the machine can translate it for me to hear. 
uh, machine translations. So if I don't know the language, like my German is not very good, I can use a translator to translate the text for me so I know what the text actually means. Or referencing a text. So there's a long text and I'm actually too lazy to read it. So I will ask the computer to read it and give me a reference. So how, what was actually said in the text? What's important? And all of this actually has led to concerns. People are saying in the future, let's say 10, 20 years from now, students will not learn to read anymore because they don't need to know how to read. I don't know if that's a true concern. I love reading and actually thinking about my grandchildren not to be able to read would be horrible or their children. So I hope it's not true, but this is the concern people have. Let's see how the computers are handling this text voice thing at the moment. So I was thinking I will ask the computer, this is the link what I was using, give me an abstract for this talk that I'm giving today. So I gave here uh, the text as the basics of deep learning Apex Connect 2020 by Heli Helskuaho and I said tell me what is my abstract. What I got here there's two options so I asked it twice. The first one uh, is saying that uh, the basics of deep learning Apex Connect 2020 by Heli Helsko, I will give you four credits. So this is obviously kind of university course or something. Cloud native and cloud native recipes for working with AI and deep learning with control and automation in the cloud. This is quite nonsense, but I don't know why I actually picked the cloud. That's quite interesting. Uh, the other, I don't know how to use this system, so I need to move it here. Uh, the other thing here is, uh, the basics of deep learning Apex Connect 2020 by Heli Helskoha, Tov Webb, Yinsen Zhu, Pedro Castillo, the Deep Learning Research Summit. So we just have a new event going on here. It's a research summit and so on and so on. So at least this particular deep learning was not able to provide me a very good um, uh, abstract. So I will try another one. Uh, this is the link that I used for this one, and I put again the basics of deep learning at Apex Connect by Heli Helskoho. The basics of deep learning at Apex Connect, at Apex Connect by Heli Helskoho is short. I will actually show you the whole text. It's very long text. In short, it's quite a broad idea. What's great about it, and there's even block called deep learning and core learning. There's a simple but easy to use sample set of articles that gives you an easy way to follow along. Now you can choose from one, one more recent, recent articles about and so on and so on. And it's very fun. It's telling that I have written blog posts and I've been doing this and that, which is not true. And it keeps telling about my GOAT app, which is very interesting. I haven't heard about it, but it looks very promising. And even a huge thanks to Heli and Heli for their feedback and support on the blog. So quite interesting, but being honest, I think I will still keep writing my research articles and, and my abstracts myself until the computer is smarter. Oh, then I tried the uh, translate. This is just the Google Translate. So I wrote here in Finnish and I asked it to translate in English. So what I actually wrote here in Finnish is that I'm go Heli is going to give a deep learning presentation in Apex Connect event. But in English, it says Heli will give a presentation on in-depth learning, which is quite interesting, isn't it? This is not what I was thinking that I will be doing here. Um, but it doesn't know a word deep learning. It just knows regular words. So my translation didn't work so well either. But if I'm very honest, this translation is much better than it was 10 years ago. So things are moving to the right direction. And, and well, again, being honest, I don't think Finnish is the first language for any kind of translation. So maybe German would work better than Finnish. Another use case for deep learning would be recommender systems. They produce suggestions or recommendations to assist users in decision-making process. There are three kind of recommender systems. The first one is collaborative filtering, CF recommender system. The recommendations are based on decisions of other users that have similar tastes as you do. 
Then we have the content-based recommender systems, which recommends based on similarities of items that you have liked in the past. So there's a new item that is quite similar to the one that you loved, and they think you might like this as well. As, as well. Then we have hybrid recommender systems, which are actually using multiple approaches together. Well, I have to test this as well. We all use Amazon, so I was thinking I go to Amazon. I do have an account there, but it doesn't know anything about me. I only have my account as an author, so it knows that I like books and I write books. And then I was once in Tokyo and I ordered some shampoo and conditioner from the Japanese Amazon. So this is all it knows. I do order books, but I'm very smart. When I need books, I ask my son to order for me. So his profile is probably a big mess because he's ordering my books. But the outcome here is they tell me to buy a book about knitting. Oh my goodness, I never knit. And you can't make me knit by giving me a book about knitting, so no way. And Japanese is, of course, my first language because I order shampoo and conditioner in Japanese. No. And there's a lot of books. I don't even speak the language that it's recommending to me. So actually here, everything goes completely wrong because Amazon doesn't know enough about me and they are guessing and they are guessing completely wrong. So these recommendations are completely useless for me. I do use Netflix. Um, when I saw this first, it tells me because you watch Another Life, you would probably like these as well. Well, I have seen actually many of these already, but for some reason, Netflix doesn't know it. My husband had a good explanation. He said, you've been sleeping during those shows. So that's Netflix knows that and recommends you to watch again, which is probably true. But anyway, uh, these recommendations are not perfect either, but much better than the ones that Amazon was giving because Netflix knows more about me. But there are also other family members. They do have their own profiles, but sometimes they use my profile to watch whatever they want to watch. So that might sometimes mix the selection that I will have here. So about recommendation systems or recommender systems, um, I think we have some work still to do on that area. And actually, I do a lot of um, research and I, I evaluate research papers, and there's a lot about recommender systems. So this area is is moving fast. What I was thinking about talking most today is about all kinds of pictures. So visual recognitions, computer vision, that kind of things. Um, it's about image classification or object recognition. Is this a car or is it a dog? Or object detection. There is a car, there's a bicycle, there's a car that has bicycle on it. Image captioning, so in a in big picture, you can find faces, you can find a dog, you can find a door, you can find a ceiling, all kinds of things you can find from one picture. Action classification, you can recognize a human being running or a cat washing itself or he, he herself self, uh, or object image fragmentation where you can separate objects from the background. So all kind of things that we can do very easily with our eyes and with our knowledge, it's not easy for computers to understand what is in the picture. And this is also used for, let's say, the, the computer realizes what's in the picture and it can actually write a text about it. So understanding what is in the picture and giving it out as a text. This is an example about recognizing what is in the picture. It recognizes traffic lights, person, handbag, car, truck, a person, and so on. So from the picture that is actually very crowded, it can recognize details. And it can also tell how sure it is about each of these uh, rec recognitions. I want to talk about pictures because pictures are everywhere. You know, you've been in a meeting and then you say, OK, I will send you that info. And the other one says, no need. I already took a picture. So it's already in the picture, the information. But how to get that information out from the picture? There is so much information. You know, a picture tells more than a thousand words. When you're trying to understand the picture, it takes a lot of training. I've been trained for I can't tell you how many years for this. My brain is very, very trained for recognizing a lot of things. Uh, it takes a lot of computing power. It takes a lot of data. 
So already all these three things makes it quite difficult for a computer to be able to recognize pictures or the information in a picture. The idea starts that each item is constructed from smaller items. So a picture has a human being who has a face, who has a nose. Feature-based object recognition. There's been a lot of research on this area for years and years and years. I put here a couple of examples from 73 and 79, where they were actually bringing this idea alive, how uh, items can be constructed from smaller items. But there are problems with pictures. The light, if the light is different, if, is it still the same dog? Or if, if the face has been, the picture has been taken from a different angle, is it still a human face? The colors, if they are very bright, it's black and white, it's uh, more red than green, it might be more difficult for the computer to read it, to understand what is in the picture. It's more difficult for us too, but not that difficult. But for computer it is. So it starts with layers. There are edges and how these edges form shapes like rectangles or circles, and then how they form particular features like an eye or a nose and so on. So all this math that we need has actually been there for a long time. We had linear regression since 17 something, uh, matrices 1850, arrows even longer than that, neural networks 1940s, so all this actually already existed. So math has been there for a long, long time. Then we had increased computing power. GPUs, the graphics processing units were introduced 1994. And TPUs, tensor processing units, were actually used in Google internally 2015 and announced to us the rest of the world 2016. So these have been a lot of improvement for computing power for all the matrices and so on that we're actually working on. A very groundbreaking research was 2001 by Viola and Jones. You know, when you're taking a picture with your phone, if there's a face, it makes some kind of rectangular around the face. This is what they invented, finding the face and marking it. The quality of the picture has improved a lot. And they are in digital format, which makes it much easier to handle with computers. And we have enough storage to store those pictures. Those who are old enough to remember when you had cameras with a film, you were very careful if you take the picture of, or not, because the film already had this, this number of uh, pictures. And if you waste pictures, it's not a good thing. So with my iPhone taking pictures, I can take like billion pictures if I want and it's not a problem. But with the film camera, it was the problem. The same goes with the storage. So the storage today is, well, I would say unlimited, which is of course not true, but you have much, much more storage available with a cheaper price than we used to have in those times. We also have more good quality data. We have data sets. I put here some examples of existing data sets and pre-trained um, models that can be used for transfer learning. I will talk about that a little bit later more. Um, and I will probably also have some time to talk about reinforcement learning. But anyway, these data sets and pre-trained models brought the efficiency of, of teaching our computers. But a very big improvement was actually convolutional neural network, ConvNet or CNN. Um, that is, well, actually, I might show you the Kant's example, if I can find it here. So this is his work. This shows how, how, it, how convolutional network works. So we have input here. There's numbers four, five, six, and so on. And it goes to the layers, and they actually take pieces of that picture, and they forward to the next layer, and so on, and so on. And in the end, on the top, you see here answer, it will recognize what it was. So this is kind of what he invented. And then uh, 2012, Kritesky and, and the fellow researchers made a lot of 
amazing breakthrough about how these things should be done using GPUs, using RELU, dropout, pre-processing, and so on and so on. So I would say 2012 was a big breakthrough for convolutional networks and for image recognition and for deep learning. So the convolutional network looks like this. Uh, I have input this picture of a dog. It's built of pixels. My pixels are quite large here, so I just put some squares here. Uh, so a pic picture of dog goes to my convolutional neural network, and the output is it tells me it's either a cat or a dog. It consists of many layers, a convolutional layer with filters, an output, and then the pooling layer, which we will flatten to be processed with neural network. I mentioned earlier that neural networks were invented a long time ago already, and they are used actually also in convolutional neural networks. So we start with the input going to convolutional layer filter. What happens here is actually we have the image matrix. Everything here or most of here is matrices. Uh, and then we have kernels. We have sharpening, blurring, edge detection, and so on and so on and so on kernels. And uh, for example, here I have an example of identity kernel. And convolution operation is using the image and the kernel to kind of make the some kind of processing for the picture to give it to the next phase in the process. These kind of uh, kernels are used to actually change nonlinear to linear. I have an example here, if I can find the right one mm, here. So how the image kernels work. So if I use, let's say I use here blur, or I use see the picture on the right hand side what happens sober impose or sharpen so it changes the picture so if we have here on the left hand side we have a lot of pixels it changes it to less pixels on the right side using a kernel so that's the trick here Actually, how it works is like this. The kernel is the, the yellow thing here going through our image pixels and converting, converting it to convolved feature. So making a big picture to smaller picture, losing some of the features the original picture had. Uh, the red things here, these uh, one and zeros are the kernel. So the kernel is, is used here. So I already showed you the image kernel. So here's, here's the link to the page that I just showed you a while ago. So after we done the filtering and we have got uh, the output for that, uh, the, the filter is done and we are ready to move to the next step, doing the pooling. So pooling, there's different algorithms for that, but usually average or max is used. Average calculates the average value for each patch of the feature map, while as max pooling is calculating the maximum value for each of these sets. I will show you here. So on the left, I have my original pixels, my original uh, photo or image, and I take I'm not sure if you can see my mouse, but I will show here the four, the gray ones, one, five, six, and three. It will evaluate those and find which one is the biggest because we are doing max pooling and comes out with six. Then it takes seven, zero, nine, and nine and seven and figures out nine is the biggest. Then the pink ones, five, two, zero, eight, eight is the biggest, and four, nine, one, three, nine is the biggest. So this is what the pooling layer is doing. 
there can be many of these layers. This is just how they work. So they can be several of these. And it's the picture is moved from this side to that side and, and transformed here and there and so on. And all is matrices. Then we are next going to flattening because we want to give this information to our neural network. Flattening is very simple. We just need to take our 1, 1, 1 and 0 to a flattened form of uh, matrix. And we pass it to our fully connected neural network. Fully connected means that we have lines between all our, whatever we have here, all these round things, we will have a line between them. So what are these round things? They are called neurons. So each of these are neurons and there can be many layers of neurons. In this example, I only have two because uh, it will be easier to read it when I only have one of each layers, but all of these can be many times here. So how the neuron works? We have inputs. The doc picture is coming in. When it comes in, we use the weights and a bias and an activation function to get the output. Is it a cat or is it a dog? So here we have several inputs. Each of them has their own weight. The bias is shared by them. So actually on the bottom here, you can see how, how um, the prediction is done with activation function, weight times input plus bias. So this is what the neuron includes. The activation function I, I mentioned earlier, it determines the output of neural network. So what is coming out from the network? There are different activation functions, step function, sigmoid function, tan h function, which is actually a scaled sigmoid, linear function, rectilinear rectifier linear units. I can't pronounce it because I always say RELU. RELU is uh, very often used. So this is something that I will explain more. So RELU works in a way that it gets, um, it takes the maximum of either zero or the value itself. So if the, if the value it gets is minus one, it will be zero. If the value is one, it will be one. So whichever is bigger, zero or the value that was given to the function. So this is how a uh, ReLU works. The output layer also has an activation function. Uh, if we are making binary predictions, like in my case, we have cats and dogs, we use sigmoid. But if we have multi-class predictions like um, town musicians of Bremen that has a lot of different animals, by the way, it's very difficult because they are on top of each other. So how to recognize that a cat is on top of a dog and so on. But that's another question. Then we use softmax function in general. There's other options as well. I put here uh, a, a web page where you can go and check how the convolutional neural network actually works. This is a very fun page. I will show it very briefly so that you will understand the point. So here is the picture that we are trying to understand. It goes through the whole convolutional network to come to output that will tell if it's a lifeboat, ladybug, pizza, and so on. So if I choose a picture here, it goes through the whole process and tells me it's a cola. It might be also red panda, but as you can see on the right-hand side, there's a small, tiny little mark here on the red panda but mostly it is koala. If I see the, the espresso cup here, it's quite sure it is espresso, but it might be uh, bell pepper or it might be orange. So the program is not completed yet. Or if I check this one, it's a ladybug. It tells me it's a ladybug. Actually, it's very sure about it. That's great. What about this one? This is a lifeboat, but it's not quite sure. It might be a ladybug as well. So what's fun with this tool is that you can go and check what's happening in each of these steps. It shows me that it's, there's, it's going on, on a red, green, and, and uh, uh, blue here. And then what's happening in the next step, and so on and so on. What happened here? 
This is the, what, what's ReLU doing, remember? This is the max function, what's happening in ReLU. And then what's happening in max pool and so on. So this is very fun to play with. And gives you a good picture how it really works. And as you can see, there are several layers in this particular convolutional network. Well, as you can already figure out, it's not easy to plan how this networks. So how many layers should I have? Uh, should I use ReLU or something else? Should I use max pool or something? Um, and so on. But there's also another question, how many epochs? So epoch is the round. So I have my data set and I pass it through the process forward and then backwards to verify that things are actually to tune uh, my process. So how many epochs should I do? And then each epoch is divided into smaller patches. So what is the correct patch size? What would be optimistic for my, my hardware and my software to handle so that it will learn as fast as possible? How many hidden layers? How many units? How many neurons in each layer? What should actually be those weights and biases? Remember, we had this, this formula. When you have input, you multiply with weight and you add, you add the bias. So multiply with what and add what? Uh, what activation function should I use? What kind of learning rate or step size, size should I use? And what kind of, kind of optimizer? So the first round, I just need to guess, but then I need to do something. This something is called backpropagation or backward propagation. This is the process for neural network to learn. So here we have the input coming on top of the picture, input X. It's coming to layer, it's going to the next layer, it's giving a prediction, and then we have a thing called loss function. So each of these steps, the weight and bias is, is uh, added to the prediction. It gives the prediction uh, the loss function here is uh, taking the prediction and the true targets. So we need to know when we are testing what actually is the true value. So we know the true value and we know the prediction and using loss function, we compare them to understand the loss score, which we will pass the optimizer, which will update the bias and the weight. And it always starts with the, the latest one first and then going further in the, in the chain. So the most important things here are the loss function and the optimizer. Loss function quantifies the distance between the predicted value and the actual value that it should have been. So actually tells us how lost are we with our prediction. These are always non-negative numbers. The smaller it is, the better it is. And if it's zero, it's perfect. So we predict it absolutely correct, we nailed it. There are several loss functions available. Uh, so depending what you prefer or what suits the best. Then we have the optimizer, the gradient descent. Uh, it's an iterative optimization algorithm for finding a local minimum of a differentiable function. So this is a differentiable function. For me, by the way, the, the most difficult thing about math is learning how to do it in English. I wouldn't have thought it's so difficult. So I've been taught uh, math in Finnish and I just can't get over it. So very funny. So, so how far to move the weights in the direction of the gradient is the question. How big steps should we take? There are different optimizers, stochastic gradient descent, which is kind of the basic one, which has improved version of momentum, and then Nesterov momentum, and then RMS prop, which is actually uh, quite popular. And then Adam, which is, I think, the latest invention of these optimizers. So this just tells what kind of steps to take so that we will not go to the other side and make the, the other kind of uh, mistake with our prediction. So what is a good step we should take? Not too small, not too big, just the optimal step. So depending what optimizer you choose, it makes the steps differently. Well, there are problems because it takes too long and it demands so much resources to build this kind of network. 
and make it work properly, making good predictions. Then there's a problem with correlation and causality. So when is it really something that depends on something? So if um, my, my favorite example is that I have been to Los Angeles once. I landed to Los Angeles and it started raining, literally, when I landed there. So you could say that when I go to Los Angeles, it starts raining. So I have a power to make rain. But that's not true. It just happened to accidentally happen at the same time. It's not really something that I can do. So when something is really dependent on something and not is sometimes a problem. Then also bias is in data because all this is about data. So if the data is biased or somehow wrong, uh, the results are wrong in the same way. Like in Finnish, we don't have she and he, we only have a person. So if I write uh, to this translator, I write that a person is a computer programmer. In Finnish, that Han on Ohjelmoja. It will tell me he is a programmer. And if I write there, uh, a person is a nurse, the translator will say he as uh, she is a nurse. So this will happen because the data is biased we, for, for some reason. Then we have overfitting and underfitting. So overfitting means that the data set actually uh, it probably was too small and our uh, machine learning model learned too well. It already knows all the pictures and it, it, it's just learned too well. We can use augmented data, so we can just use the data set we have, but switch those pictures a little bit, change maybe the lights or the angle or something like that to build more data. And another thing that can be done is drop out. So we just tell um, randomly to drop some of our nodes from the, from the network and not use those to process the data. If we do too much of that, we made um, made uh, end up with underfitting. So when it's not learning enough, because when we don't have enough of those, um, uh, because of dropout, we don't have enough um, neurons in the network. It's not, it's learning too robustly. It's not learning details. By the way, it's also possible that it's learning wrong, like the classical example of dogs and wolves. So um, deep learning learned very well the pictures of dogs and wolves, it's, it knew exactly this is a dog and this is a wolf. Until one beautiful day when there was a picture of a wolf, obvious wolf, and the machine said, yes, it's a dog. Then the people started to, to figure out why did it say it wrong and found out that every time they were training the model, the wolves were in the snow and the dogs were in the grass. So instead of learning wolves and dogs, the model learned grass and snow. So when the wolf was in the grass, it was actually a dog. So transfer learning is something that can save our lives because it makes things much faster. So we have pre-trained networks and we use what they have learned this is what I try with my kids. I tell, try to tell them, I have already learned this. You don't have to do it again. But for some reason, for human beings, it doesn't work. So we want to make our own mistakes and learn by the mistakes. But for computers, we might want to try this. So using pre-trained networks, we actually give the information, the knowledge this network already has to a new one. So we just find new features that are interesting. Uh, let, let it find those and use the pre-trained um, network already with a new classifier. And it doesn't have to learn everything from the scratch, only what the classifier needs to learn. I was thinking I will show you a quick example of um, my real life face detection. Because if this sounded very complex, it is not complex at all. This is something me and my husband did quite a long time ago already with Python. It's about uh, face recognition for our house alarm system, which is also already also programmed with Python. So if there are human faces, take a photo, identify the, fo the, the faces and let me know how many faces there are. And let's see how it looks like. This is definitely what I'm showing you. It's definitely a web page. I recommend you to go and check if you are interested about 
uh, facial recognition. So we have a camera, we have Raspberry Pi here. I put the picture, uh, the pen here, so you can see how small it is. And this is, by the way, the old generation as well. So it's even cooler nowadays. And then we have this camera on the left-hand side, which is also equally small. The code comes from pyimagesearch.com. This is the web page I recommend you go and check if you're interested about Python and if you're interested about uh, any kind of facial recognition things. So a small piece of code, copy paste, maybe a little bit of editing, not much more than that. It's already pre-trained, so it already recognizes faces. You don't have to teach much. This is the first test. So we are sitting on the sofa and my husband starts the program and it tells me two faces and it marks those two faces. Then remember I told you about the, the lights, uh, the, the colors and all these kind of things. Well, that I didn't figure out in the beginning, but I figured out that in the, in the specs, it told me it has to be a whole face. So I was thinking, let's test with a half face, where to find a half face from the book cover. So I took a book cover where, Frank, uh, where, where Trump has half face, and I was thinking, let's see if it recognizes half a face. And it did recognize Trump, but it also recognized our curtains because the lights were changed and it somehow looked like a face or another explanation is we have a ghost in our house. But anyway, the second test shows four faces instead of two or three. So that was quite a simple example how machine learning can be done in your own environment very, very easily. Now I can't find my presentation back. Come on. Okay. Uh, and especially Python has a lot of libraries for any kind of image recognition things. Now I'm going to start this to show you something about reinforcement learning. Does it work? No, I have to copy paste. I didn't want to start it beforehand because it would be spoiling the whole fun. Let's put it here. So I was thinking I will explain very briefly something about reinforcement learning because this is something completely different. Oh, I will just let that run there while I talk. Um, the idea in reinforcement learning, how can I, by the way, get the voice off hmm. like this so we don't have to, okay, now we have this option here. So the idea here is that we have a car that needs to learn how to park. So the computer doesn't know any rules. We know that when you're trying to park a car, it's probably easier if you don't hit any other cars or poles or anything. Just try not to hit anything and try to drive on your side of the street and so on and so on and so on. So when the computer is trying to do the same, it knows nothing. It has to try every single error by itself. Trying, trying, and trying. This is called reinforcement learning. So how it works is that we have environment. In this example, we have this, this parking area. Uh, then we have agent, the car. And whenever it does something, the environment will reward it and move it to the next state. So it will tell complete failure, uh, you hit the other car. You should not do that. Fantastic, you were driving in the right side of the street, continue like this. So the reward, reward function is what's teaching this car to drive. So how it's going on, it's trying, it's already 52, 55, 56, 10,000 times and it still doesn't know how to park because it has no data. But where would we have this kind of data to give, give this car to learn to park? So in the case when we don't have the, the data to train, we can let the computer build the data itself. And this is, I think, probably the coolest thing at the moment in the machine learning area. 
it will eventually learn, but I can tell you it takes quite many attempts. But when it learns, it learns. And actually, it will be a better parker than I will be. Because if I teach this, this car to park with my knowledge, it will be equally good as me. But if it's teaching itself, it can be much, much better than I am because it can have its one billion tries to learn how to park. So it will learn, but it will take quite a lot of time to do that. That was the presentation. And I will let this run here if you want to see how the car is doing. And any questions, I'm happy to answer. Thank you very much for attending. Um, thanks, Haley. Um, so far, no questions. Oh, but good. <laughs> I think it's uh, not, not that easy topic um, you talked about. No, uh, this what, is not an easy was... topic. This is quite difficult. I will let you see the car going here. <laughs> we are 20,000 now, and we still don't know how to park. See, the car even missed the parking spot. And but now trying to figure end? out which way to go. <laughs> But, and, and and when does it succeed? After how many attempts? Oh, I think Is it's there... like fifty thousand or something. Can't remember okay. the exact number, but it will take a long, long time to learn. But actually, we are the same. It takes sometimes much longer for us to learn something. Depending, look, it's almost there, almost there. But what will happen next? Almost. So it has learned quite a lot already. See all those lines in front of the car and back of the car. So with those, the computer knows what is close and what is far and so on. So it will get um, feedback for the reward, fu reward function. So quite okay. cool. Oh. <laughs> um, we got a question, Eli. Mm -hmm. um, the question from Laban is, um, do you have the resources on the Westbury Pi image detection online? Uh, what was your question? Um, do you have the resources on the Westbury Pi image detection online? So Free resources? The example you, yeah, yeah this example all... you showed with the images. Yeah. Yeah, that's all free resources. Yes. And there's a very cool new ones uh, detecting age of the person. So, well, actually, I can show you one here. So, I probably have it open where? No, here. So um, this is an example of one of those things that he has made on the web page. And I have just used it and edited a little bit to know how it works. And this is actually uh, recognizing from the data set I found from Gaggle, if the picture is of a man or a woman. So he has examples for free for anybody to go and just try. And if you want to try Python easily, not with too much to, to hassle, you can use a thing called Anaconda Navigator that will in, install everything for you. This is not for production purposes. This is for you to learn how things work and try all these cool things that you will get from that web page. And it's all okay. for free. He also sells courses and he sells um, uh, books which are amazing, by the way. So if you're more interested about this, that's the page I would go definitely to. See, it was able to park. Yeah, yeah, I saw it. Yay, 50,000 <laughs> times and it's able to park. Okay. Amazing. Yeah. <laughs> um, so thank you for your presentation. Um, thank you. And we will proceed with the next presentation at 11 o'clock with Danny Snyder about make it faster miss about SQL performance. So thanks Haley and thank you. Bye bye. To, hope to see Stay you safe. next year then. Yeah I hope so too. <laughs> In bye. Reality. Bye.